I'm having a hard time getting this in. That's why. Okay, if we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Galatians, book of Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians 5, we're going to be reading from verse 15, uh, verse 13, sorry, verse 13. And we will read down to verse 18. It says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. And again, God blesses the reading of his precious word to us uh, <clears throat> this afternoon. Uh, so we, we're just I want to give you a little bit of an outline to this chapter. I should have done it earlier, but sometimes you get so carried away, you forget to do those kind of things. So verses 1 through 12, we, we looked at freedom from the law, and particularly legalism. The Lord has set us free from the law, from its dictates. And by the way, it's good to remind ourselves uh, he says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where, wherewith Christ has made you free, or made us free. And sometimes we forget the high cost of our freedom. Uh, sometimes I think that in a natural sense, that we, we think of uh, people that gave their lives, sacrificed their lives in, in the Second World War so that we could have freedom, and yet how have we used that freedom? I remember watching a a documentary of, of British soldiers, and they, they were asked the question years afterwards, was it worth it? And when they saw what had happened to the country, they wondered whether it was worth it at all. Would you do it again? Well, I'm not sure. Isn't that interesting? Sad. And, and the problem is that that freedom can be abused. Even though it was bought at a tremendous price, it can be abused. And so the Lord is, uh, well, Paul is reminding us, stand fast, don't give up the freedom that has been won for you at such a great price. And part of that freedom is from the law. Don't become entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Don't, don't go back into that old legalistic system that you're free from. And then in verse 13 through 15, we're going to be looking at this session, freedom from license. Because the other extreme of legalism is not liberty, it's license. Freedom from license. Not to live a life where we think, well, Christ has set me free, I can just do whatever I want now. Right? That was not the purpose of him going to Calvary for us to lead, leave a lot, lead a life of self-gratification and just self-absorbed doing what I want. That was not the point of him going to the cross. He had a higher purpose than that. And, and so uh, freedom from license. And then in verses uh, 16 to the end of the, uh, to, down to the end of the chapter, uh, we want to look at freedom from the flesh. And of course, uh, the flesh is never going to go away but we can enjoy freedom from the flesh's power and dictates in our lives. And, of course, we're going to see that that's by the Spirit. So we want to look at these things together. They're very important things because they're things that we're dealing with on a constant basis. And we mentioned earlier that in our lives, we probably have all had the experience where we've either tended towards uh, the, the, the heart of a Pharisee and legalism that's been in, in some of us, <laughs> has been there. And then there's been other times when we've had gone to the other extreme where, where licenses maybe been more where we've been. And, and truth is not in those ditches, right? 
it's not in either of those ditches. And we've got to find ourselves in the, in the middle place, which is always the hardest place to be. And so he says in verse 13, he says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And the language here is interesting. The word occasion, the word occasion to the flesh here, it, it, it's, it's simply, it's a military term, and it has the idea of a base of operations or a beachhead. That's the idea. And so he's saying, um, we've been called to liberty, but don't allow liberty to be a beachhead for the flesh to come in and dominate our lives. Don't allow that to happen. And oftentimes, people can do that. They can, they can abuse Christian liberty. They can say, well, Christ has set me free, so I can do whatever I want, basically. And so he says, don't allow that to happen. And I think of uh, this idea of a base of operation. It's kind of, I think of uh, one of the places I've loved going to over the years is the Normandy landing beaches. And, you know, kind of to defeat uh, fortress Nazi Germany, there had to be a beachhead. <laughs> and that beachhead was the Normandy beaches. And they, once they got a beachhead, it wasn't long before they had, they had defeated and mopped up the whole thing. And so the idea is this. That the, the flesh is always looking for a beachhead to destroy your life. Always looking. And so he said, don't allow that to happen. Uh, don't, don't allow it to happen. Now, what, what do we mean when we talk about the flesh? Well, of course, uh, NIV translates it as sinful nature. Um, but I, I think uh, it's all that man is, is and is capable of as a sinful human being apart from the intervention of God's Spirit in his life. All the evil that man is and is capable of, apart from the intervention of God's Spirit, God's grace in our lives. And so uh, one thing we need to recognize, that our flesh, uh, Paul says this, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, right? And uh, it's, it, it, I've noticed that my flesh has not improved with age, <laughs> right? Uh, even with all the Christian kind of exposure, my flesh has not improved one iota. It's incurably wicked <laughs> and uh, always wants to feed on dirt, constantly, has a voracious appetite for dirt, and uh, never changes. And so this, this is a very serious thing, this idea of the flesh. And, and uh, we, we recognize the difficulty. And so freedom, if it's not directed properly, can become a beachhead for the flesh. And uh, I want you just to look at the verse in Jude just for a second. And uh, I, the book of Jude and verse 4. It says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of, or, of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so turning it into lasciviousness. And, and so there's this danger that uh, this freedom we have uh, can indeed be abused. And so it's interesting. What he says is this. He says, brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And so it's interesting. There's different kind of aspects of slavery here. There's, there's this, this bondage or slavery to the law that he's spoken of. And then there's kind of this slavery to the flesh because sin and the flesh are enslaving. And then there's another type of service uh, that he is encouraging us to be involved in. He says, instead of using your freedom as, as a beachhead for the flesh, instead, he says, by love, serve one another. Use your newfound freedom through love to serve one another. 
it, it's, it's not a biblical statement, but <laughs> in one sense, it, it's, it's very true. Uh, the devil finds work for idle hands to do. You ever heard that? And, and so if we're busy serving one another, and especially if it's in the energy of divine love, then there won't be a lot of time for the flesh to get a beachhead in our lives. Right? So, so be, be active in that kind of service. That's what he says. And of course the law says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so he's saying, use your liberty, motivated by love, to serve one another. Instead of allowing it to become a beachhead for the flesh. And then he says this in verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But I mentioned this uh, the other day that um, uh, you know, Wesley, as he wrestled with this idea of holiness and holy living, uh, verses like this really impacted his thinking. And he, what he said was that if, if we could be filled with perfect love, we wouldn't have problems with sin. Now, where he went wrong was he thought you could get it all at once rather than a daily dependence. But nevertheless, his basic thesis was this, and, and it was correct, that if, if we were filled with holy love, we wouldn't be involved in sin. We'd be serving. We'd be doing things that are productive. We'd be useful. And so that was his basic thesis, and he has a lot of things to say that are very, I think, biblical, but he just, again, he thinks we get it all at once. And... Uh, and of course, it's a daily moment by moment, isn't it? But I wanted just to say this, that the Christian love, he says, in a sense, is the fulfillment. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And, and again, this is found throughout the word of God, isn't it? It's found in the Old Testament law, believe it or not. Book in, in fact, it's a direct quotation from the Old Testament law and the book of Leviticus. And the difficulty with the law is that there was no Holy Spirit shed abroad in their hearts to enable them to do this. But nevertheless, the, the, the command was given, Leviticus 19, verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And of course, the Lord Jesus quoted from that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, and verse 39. And so, and then the Apostle Paul in the in the Epistle to the Romans. Look at Romans thirteen, Romans chapter thirteen and verses eight through ten. He says, "O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly." comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so what we could say for all of us in our struggles with the flesh and with, with sin, maybe we need to be praying more earnestly, Lord, would you fill my heart with your love? So that I can love the brethren, that I can love a lost and dying world, that I could be a person who, and of course, when we look at even our heroes, uh, I don't know if anybody has ever read it, but without doubt, probably one of the most compelling biographies connected to the brethren movement is Robert Chapman of Barnstable, right? Brother indeed. And, and, and what, what, what's the story there? He actually got mail delivered to his address just simply said, Apostle of Love, England. And it went to his address. Robert Cleaver Chapman, R.C. Chapman. The most amazing biography. And what was the thing about his life? Love. <laughs> and, and he lived a life of love. He said, you know, he said, many preach Christ. My goal is to live Christ. And that's what he sought to do. And his life was one of love. And it, and it was a powerful, impactful life. To this hour, it's impacting people. And so, again, we might say, Lord, that's what I want. And, and, and of course, Romans 5.5 5 says the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who was given to us. But somehow, 
there, there seems to be a, a, a blockage here in many of our lives. And, and I think part of it is um, maybe we're not intentional enough in saying, Lord, I, I want to do this. I want to, I want to yield myself fully to your Holy Spirit that you might love this needy world through me. Kind of an intentional desire. And so he talks about love. And so then he goes on and he says, um, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another, of one another. Have you ever, I'm sure some of you have, been involved in conflict in a local church? <laughs> I think it's the most stressful experience I've ever known in my life. And I've been through some stressful things, but nothing compares to going through conflict in the local church. And, and by, when, whenever there's conflict, whatever the, the root cause of it, and often Scripture is quite, quite clear, it, Scripture says this, only by pride cometh contention. We've got all kinds of different reasons that we give for our problems, but God cuts through all the nonsense and says, no, it's none of those things. It's actually pride. Only by pride, exclusively by pride comes contention. But, but when that contention comes, the flesh always shows up. And people begin to act in the flesh, and there are things that are said that should never be said that, that cause deep wounds that last for years. Maybe some of you are still hurting from wounds received from God's people. Talk about being wounded in the house of your friends. <laughs> we've, we've been there, right? And, and so he's concerned, he said, because if you bite and devour one another, and he's talking like wild dogs. Like these are sheep. They're not wild dogs. They're, they're God's sheep, but they're, sometimes they're acting like wild dogs. And they're savagely tearing each other apart. And the idea is that, he says, you've got to be careful. Instead, you see, instead of, instead of loving one another, what you guys do, are doing is you're tearing each other apart. That could be said of many assembly. Tearing each other apart. And meanwhile, the, the world is going to hell in a handbasket while we're beating each other to death. That's the tragedy. Because you're not interested in gospel labors when, when you've got that conflict. All you can think about is that conflict. All this internal heartache that's going on. And so he says, <laughs> if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consume one another. And the thought is this, that the, the testimony is going to be destroyed. Totally destroyed. And let me, let's be honest, COVID, COVID brought out a lot of flesh. Amongst God's people. And a lot of assemblies, if they ever do recover, some of them, and I'm not talking of getting COVID, I'm talking of the impact of the flesh because of it, will they ever recover? I don't know. Some of them may never recover. Terrible things happening. And what have we done? Well, we gave a base of operation, didn't we? For the flesh. <laughs> we gave it a beachhead. COVID gave us a beachhead for the flesh, and it's wrought havoc. And people are tearing one another apart as a result of it. And still, the hurts go deep and continue on. And sometimes, you wonder, will they be healed ever? No, it can't. I've actually seen three assemblies that were torn apart. In fact, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was speaking at a conference. And I could tell the conference that you could cut the atmosphere like a knife. You knew there was something happening. And, and straight after the conference, there was a division. I didn't get invited. I actually kept in touch with both sides. They kind of had two assemblies for a while. And I preached in both because it wasn't my war. It wasn't my battle. I, I love both sets of brethren, so I met with both. But eventually, they came back together again. And I was there, just happened to be a conference weekend when they came together and broke bread again for the first time after those. And I want to tell you, you know how it happened? One brother who had said a lot of nasty things at a regional elders meeting apologized to everybody publicly for his flesh 
and what he had said, and he begged their forgiveness. And if pride comes by contention, humility fosters unity. In this guy, and this guy, I've always loved this brother, but I said to him, I, I thought a lot of you before this, but brother, you're a hero to me. To do that was huge, and it brought about healing. And I, I just was there recently, this year for their conference, and they said, you know what's amazing, Mike? He said, you'd never know if there's ever been a split. It's a seamless healing. Isn't that wonderful? can happen. How does it happen? Love. Humility. How did it break apart? <laughs> Pride in the flesh. Right? That's what it's all about, really. So he said, be, be careful you don't do this. And so then he goes on, and uh, he says in verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the Holy Spirit is God's answer to the flesh. We can't fight flesh ourselves because you can't fight, fight flesh with flesh. Even if it's religious flesh with all the determination in the world, you can't fight flesh with flesh. You need the Spirit of God to enable you to live a life pleasing to the Lord. You can't do it in your own strength. And so the Holy Spirit is God's answer. And so it's interesting. I want you to go back with me to the book of Exodus. And I want to look at sometimes we find that Old Testament pictures, types, can sometimes help us understand New Testament precepts more clearly. I found that to be true. In, maybe because my mind works in pictures, but I, I love the types of the Old Testament. I find them very helpful. And so we get to Exodus 17, children of Israel have uh, come uh, out of um, Egypt and uh, they're on their journeys. And we'll notice verse 16. Let's, let's back up to verse, um, verse 8. He says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose out. Uh, chooses out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. <laughs> and... I don't, I've never been a charismatic before, but I, I, I do think this, that it, there's nothing wrong with lifting your hands up, but if you hold them up for a long time, eventually they become like lead weights. <laughs> and there's a battle going on here. This is not a five-minute battle. This is a major battle. And his hand, hands are up, and he's, they're beginning to weigh heavily. And as his hands come down, Amalek prevails. And so it says, Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, or Nisi, for he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, Amalek is an Old Testament type of the flesh. And so this is a, it's a marvelous picture in a sense. Uh, and, and actually it comes uh, after Moses struck the rock and the water gushed out. That's a picture of the giving of the Spirit, right? John 7, uh, you know, kind of the Lord Jesus out of his... Innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Straight after the giving of the Spirit, the next thing that happens is Amalek shows up. Flesh and spirit in conflict. That's what we're going to be looking at in Galatians 5. And, and it's a wonderful picture because up on the mountain, you have one with hands raised, and wherever the hands raised, there's victory. By the way, don't we have somebody standing at God's right hand? 
on our behalf, ever living to make intercession for us. And by the way, his hands never get tired. And he prays for us that we would win the victory against Amalek. That we would. But what's interesting is, when you look at the wording of verse 16, because we tend to think that the battle is really between me and the flesh. But notice what he says in verse 16. He said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek. In one sense, it's not my battle. The battle is the Lord's. But the Lord will have war with Amalek. And that's why it says the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Right? That's where the real battle is between the spirit and the flesh. And so, just I want you just to look at Deuteronomy. We're just kind of taking that picture a step further. Book of Deuteronomy, where we get uh, some additional information in Deuteronomy 25 and verse 17 concerning this battle. <clears throat> it says, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou was faint and weary and feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. So what we get here, an uh, additional little bit of de detail, and it's the attack came on those who were stragglers and those who were tired. You notice that? They're kind of, that's, that's who we, at Amalek attacked. Now, there's a practical application to that. I find myself personally most vulnerable to the, for the flesh's attack when I'm tired. Right? When I'm tired. <laughs> uh, I'm a morning person. Early in the morning, I don't have much battles with the flesh. <laughs> Nighttime, I'm really tired. I'm not thinking rationally. I'm not coherent. <laughs> and, and that's when the flesh comes and attacks, right? He recognizes when, when we're at our weakness. By the way, isn't it wonderful? The Lord says that there's a day coming when he will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek. That's what we're talking about, the rapture being so appealing, because the remembrance of Amalek and the battle with the flesh will be over. But here's the interesting thing. As you follow through, Mercer's been talking about these different themes that go through, but one of the themes is given us here. He says, when you get into the land, you should blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You remember King Saul? What was he tasked with? Wipe out Amalek. And he spared Agag. Remember that? And it's a picture of the danger of going easy on the flesh. Go to the book of Esther. What about this guy Haman? Where's he from? Haman the Agagite. <laughs> Almost destroyed Israel. And so the point is this, that you and I, in a sense, if we go easy on the flesh, we are setting ourselves up for real trouble. You, you cannot, for a single second, cease to be vigilant in this conflict. That is going on. And so again, let's go back to Galatians, just keeping those pictures um, in the back of our minds. Now, again, he says, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the, the flesh. Now, we, we say this, every true believer is indwelt by the spirit. We, we know that to be true. Uh, part of the package, if you like, of, of when you believe the gospel, and trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the one that died on the cross for you, one of the things that happens is that the Spirit of God comes and takes up residence in your life. And you now have this indwelling heavenly guest 
who lives within you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with all of these things. So you've got this indwelling heavenly guest. Wonderful thing to think about. And he's a real person. Living within you is a real person. And you didn't get a bit of him. You got all of him, right? Because he's a person. So you didn't just get a bit. You got the whole person. The whole, whole person lives within you. So when you, it says walk in the Spirit, the idea is this, that you have to relinquish control and walk in dependence moment by moment on your indwelling heavenly guest. And as you do that, step by step, and it is a step by step, moment by moment, dependence on this indwelling heavenly guest, as you do that, he says, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. When he's in control, the flesh will not be a problem. And so that's what he says. And so, again, God has no plans to improve our flesh whatsoever. It's incurably evil. We've said that all along. And so instead, we, and of course, it's not, sadly, it's in some ways, the eradication of the old nature would be marvelous if it was true. I'd really buy into that doctrine if it was true. And I'd preach it, but... It isn't. We know we still have the flesh. So therefore, we have to walk moment by moment in dependence on the Spirit. And the promise, and it is a promise, he says, if you do this, this I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he talks about this conflict that's going on between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary, the one toward the other. Just like we saw in Galatians 4, in verse 29, where it says, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Ishmael and Isaac, right? Remember uh, the, the miracle birth versus the man's engineering, the energy, the, the energy of the flesh. There's this conflict. There's a persecution. The two just cannot get along. The free woman and the bondwoman can't get along. Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, and Jerusalem below, don't get on. The, the two just cannot get along together. So there's this inner conflict. And then he says this remarkable thing. He says, but if you are led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. I love this. What he's telling me is this, that the Holy Spirit, if I'm being led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will never lead me back to Sinai. Ever. He'll not lead me to Sinai. He'll lead me to Calvary, but he'll not lead me to Sinai. Is that interesting? That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, gentlemen. <laughs> Okay, Chris, it's all right. I'm, I was in a Caribbean meeting last week, so you just <laughs> speak away. This is okay. But he, but he, he will never lead us to sign here. And, and so he's, he, this idea of being led of the Spirit is a beautiful idea. Part, it's one of the marks of sonship. Uh, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And so uh, not only allowing him to control us, but allowing him to lead us, to lead us moment by moment, dependence on him, his promptings, his directing in our lives. And, and again, I think we, we maybe don't give enough attention to this kind of thing. Now, now, again, if any group of believers should believe in the leading of the Spirit, it should be us. Because you've been at the Lord's Supper and you have witnessed, I am sure, at least once, the leading of the Spirit in the remembrance meeting, right? Have you, ever, have you seen that? Marvelous, isn't it? Just marvelous. And it's like, and, and as we said, sometimes you get visitors and they'll say, who wrote the script? I mean, this, they, they can see there's a clear theme here and, and they don't know, and they feel like somebody has, has, has given everybody what to say. And yet nobody's had any, no collusion, humanly speaking whatsoever, but hearts that the, the true leader of our appreciation of the Lord Jesus, I'm not saying the term that was, I was told not to say yesterday, but you know the idea that the true leader was the Spirit of God. He was leading the people of God 
in appreciation of the Son of God, and he was leading in a perfect way. But we have to say this, that the Spirit of God is not exhausted after Sunday morning at 10.30. He can lead you just as clearly on Monday morning. He can lead you at 11 o'clock in the ministry meeting, and even though you've planned your message, he can, he, the Spirit can lead you in a completely different direction. Even in the middle of a message, the Spirit of God can direct you differently. He, he can lead you to, to speak to somebody. You had no thought about it whatsoever, and, and the promptings of the Spirit of God can direct you to speak to a soul, and they're ready. I've had that happen. Clear leading of the Spirit. He can lead you to call somebody. Some Christian uh, can come to your mind, uh, and, and you feel this prompting, I, I, I need to give him a call. And you call them, and, and it's so timely. It's like they, they, they recognize God was in this. And so our lives would be so much more filled with adventure if we would be more conscious of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And and it's a, it is amazing life when you and and again I just want to r- recommend a, a a marvelous book. Um, it's it's called it's by Charles Stanley, not the Baptist pastor that died recently, but Charles Stanley of Rotherham. It's called Incidents in Gospel Work, the way the Lord led me. And it's a marvelous testament to God's this guy this guy what he did for a living. Uh, he he sold hardware, but but he used his job to preach the gospel, basically. So he'd go to the train station, and he'd say to the Lord, where do you want me to go today? And the Lord had, had put a definite impression on his mind, go to this place. He'd go to this place, he'd sell a few items to pay his bills, and then he'd preach. And one day he was led very consciously to this this town to preach the gospel. It was very clear on his mind. And when he goes, it's harvest time, and there's not a soul to be seen anywhere. The whole town is empty. But he knows the Lord's led him there, so he stands on a doorstep of a house and preaches the gospel to nobody because he's, the Spirit's leading him. Now, come on. Ezekiel preached in a graveyard, and he preached to the wind. So he, did, he, he obeys this prompting. Behind the door is a family waiting to come out. And in those days, they had manners. They didn't just barge through the door. They waited till the man had finished speaking. While he was preaching, the whole family got saved. The book is full of stories like that. And again, he was, quote, exclusive brethren. So he wasn't Pentecostal. Never even heard of the Pentecostal movement. But he had heard of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And he allowed the Spirit to lead him. And so, again, we just want to say, uh, are we missing out on, on, on the abundant life because of our neglect of the person and work of the Holy Spirit? Could that be? And I think it could be. I think that, again, part of it, we've said this over the years, that, that there's been an overreaction to... Pentecostal craziness or charismatic craziness, perhaps a fairer way of putting it, that, that we have gone to the other extreme where we're, we're very gun-shy, afraid of the very topic of the Holy Spirit. But in this, and, and, and again, is, is, it, is the, our uh, lack of consciousness of the person of the Holy Spirit the reason why the flesh is so prevalent in our meetings. Why is there so much division? Why is there so much moral failure amongst us? Could it be that we're neglecting the source of victory and power and abundant joy by ignoring the heavenly indweller? And so it's good to ask ourselves the question ourselves. How conscious am I? Brother Peter Brandon, amazing man in many ways. He's with the Lord too, but he wouldn't put his feet on the floor on a morning before acknowledging that he was a vile sinner 
And he had no hope of ever living the Christian life unless the Lord, the Spirit, would lead him. And before his foot touched the ground. And moment by moment, and he was, his life was so fruitful, so productive for God. And so we've got to ask ourselves, where are we in all of this? And so let me just say one, one other thing here, um, uh, which I think is important for us to think about. Two, and that is, we did say that Amalek attacks when we're tired. And so I think it's important to have a strategy. We know when we're vulnerable and when we're weak, right? So, so you've got to, you have to recognize, Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. Right? We know how he works. So you've got to make some kind of plans or strategies to, to not allow yourself to be in a vulnerable place when you're tired. Go to bed. <laughs> go to sleep. Like if you're tired, just go to bed and don't take a computer with you and don't take a phone with you. Just go to bed. Right? Simple things. But, but like have a strategy. Because the price of failure is way too high, right? The flesh, as we're going to see, we're going to talk about this in our next session. We're going to talk about this factory that manufactures pollution. The works of the flesh are these. And we don't want to be this pollute. The world has already got enough pollution through sin without our flesh adding to the manufacturing capacity. The works of the flesh of these, we don't want that. We don't want that pollution. There's enough of it out there. So we have to make a strategy. Lord, how do, I, how do I counteract this? Well, first of all, it's a life of dependence on the Spirit of God. But sometimes when you're tired, you're not thinking properly. Right? First thing in the morning, I'm crystal clear. Everything's clear as... Nine and ten o'clock at night. Things are not so clear. Right? So I've got to make a strategy. And usually that strategy is going to bed at nine o'clock. <laughs> That's my strategy. I go to bed. <laughs> because I, huh? So anyway, just uh, just wanted to bring those things before our time is gone. But let's, let's just pray and then we'll have some discussion. But Father, we just, uh, again, we're thankful that uh, your desire is for us to to enjoy freedom in the Lord Jesus and to, to not abuse it, but to use it so that by love we serve one another. And Father, we pray that these truths in your word would just grip us. Lord, it's not that we're hearing new things maybe. Maybe we've heard these things before. But Father, we know that concerning this, this ongoing battle, we do need timely reminders from your word of God. And so help us, Lord, to just uh, to live this life of dependence on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We'll give thee the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A few comments. Some of the topics we talked about there today about the charismatic thing, you know, it's covered like a hundred mile house last weekend and said we were so afraid of the charismatic access that we stifled. The Holy Spirit, like, whoa, that, that sounds like it's carried back. We won't even touch on that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like last night, me and the young, the young kids were up at the lodge up there talking about, you know, the flesh, and you know, when you get really, really tired of that. And, you know, we discussed about it, you know, how do you fight with that? And, you know, it's just like, well, thy word have I hid in my heart that it might not sin against you. And to mention to also, you know, like, with, you know, I trained with the best in Canada for wrestling. We got on purposely tired, and then you had to learn how to perform through that tiredness, you know. And you know, it just you work at it, you work at it, you work at it, and, yeah, and go to bed. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's interesting. I, I meant to say that um, what what is interesting, and I I know Warren's coming on Luke, but there's there's more emphasis in Luke's gospel of the Lord Jesus as the dependent man on prayer and his relationship with the Holy Spirit in any other gospel. 
And so if the Lord Jesus as a man saw this, set this example, if you like, as a dependence on God in prayer and dependence on the Spirit of God, who are we to think that we could ever remotely resemble the Lord Jesus without availing of those same resources? So I think that's a very, very important principle. Do you know if that book is on STEM Publishing? It is, it is, yeah. So that book, STEM Publishing, is a website, S-T-E-M, publishing.org or .com, I think either one works. Oh, yeah. But on there, they have all the old exclusive writings, including C.H. McIntosh, uh, all searchable, and they also have Charles Stanley's uh, biography and all of his writings, yeah, including the book. So, so yeah, yeah, so you don't even have to buy it. It's, it's right, if you can read on your com you know, computer. You can download it, you can download all that stuff at the Word, no problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful resource. Yeah, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. I think it's a question rather than maybe a, a statement, but uh, earlier in Galatians, Paul writes about uh, having to oppose Peter uh, in, in Antioch because of his behavior. Was you see that part, that situation, as kind of your description there, where Peter may have fell into the carnal man and not yeah. the, the spiritual man. Yeah, and so, so where was, what, what direction, direction was Peter going? going? Remember we, we said there's two ways religious, you can go religious, religious flesh or rotten flesh. Peter's legalism, legalism. And, and part of it is the, the Judaistic party were very intimidating. Right, so, and often for legalism to continue, it's usually carried forward by very intimidating individuals. So when they came around, Peter, Peter kind of, and, and even Barnabas was carried away. So this great encouraging brother who had gone to the Gentiles and saw the grace of God, and now he's carried. So again, if, if Peter and, and Barnabas had a possibility of going back into legalism, don't think that you can be immune from it. If you can go that way, or you can go the other way. Peter, and, yep. and I'm going to use this word carefully, great Peter, yep. could be carried away in such a way, you know, during the time of the Holy Spirit. Then. Yeah, and, and amazingly, Peter was the one who was the first to go to the Gentiles in Cornelius' household, and he was the one that kind of defended it, you know, with witnesses, and then all of a sudden, these boys come around, and they're so intimidating, he's, he's tended to go back into that. What is the, the greatest intimidating factor of uh, legalistic type people like that? You know what it is? They attack you by saying that you're not spiritual. You're not spiritual, yeah, yeah that's right. That's, I can remember that distinctly. You didn't wear the right clothes, you didn't, when I was in the other line of meetings. That was always the weapon they used. You're not spiritual, you're yeah. carnal. Yeah. And uh, nobody wants to be carnal, so they uh, capitulate to the, the legalist's uh, yeah. whims. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and some, some of the men, men, I have to say, uh, so, so I remember once being at a conference, and, and there was a brother there, and this brother could minister Christ in a powerful way. But sometimes there's a, there's a tendency to play to the audience. So this day, he spoke on length of hair, length of skirts, like it was just pure legalism, the whole message. And I felt robbed. But I think everybody else felt a lot. But he was playing to the crowd. And so there's a, send a tendency that we can do that. We can tell people what we know will be appreciated, especially on the people that have the finances that keep the system going. Right? Uh, comment on your, some of your last points there. Um, I think I want to put a question in it and then comment after as well. Um, would we agree that we don't usually take doctrine from our experience? Correct. Right? right? Okay. So then um, I, I asked myself a little while ago, what scripture would um, support the idea that we just heard and we believe? that um, the Spirit leads in the breaking of bread. And um, 
maybe, does anybody have a response to that? And then I have something else that I want to add, if, if I can do it this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any scriptures that allow us to, to point to the idea that the Spirit would lead during the breaking of bread? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, I, I think First Corinthians 14 talks about people... Now again, it's not necessarily a breaking of bread meeting, but it is a meeting where, yeah, and there is clear spirit movement. Okay, so you're referring, are you, to so the the, where it says that the prophets speak two or three, and then yeah. the others judge, yeah. and yeah. if something is revealed to the prophet who's sitting by, yeah. Yeah. let the first hold his peace and let yeah. the other speak. Yeah. Yes, it took me a long time to get there. Yeah. What I did was, I looked up verses in the scripture about the leading of the spirit. Yeah. And all I found was scripture that had to do with in my daily life the Lord leading me. Yeah. I couldn't find one in, in the in the actual meetings. Yeah. And then I found Corinthians, first Corinthians uh, fourteen. Yeah. And I saw that and I went, There it is. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah. and another, another aspect of first Corinthians fourteen is that the unbeliever comes in. Yes. Right? And and it's like and I I've actually had that happen where I've spoken at a meeting. And somebody came up absolutely incensed. He wanted to know who had told me about him. <laughs> I'd never met a guy in my, my life. I didn't know anything about him, but I just I looked at the mirror. But he really felt like the Lord had, you know, somebody had tipped me off. Well, that's exactly what's happening in First Corinthians 14. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the, if the Lord told the Samaritan woman there was a day coming that you would be um, able to worship in truth, in spirit, our spirit with truth, and that's what the Holy Spirit enables. He enables us, in John 16, guides us into all truth. Mm -hmm. He speaks of the Lord. And so that's what we want in all of our meetings, to the person opening the word, the person sharing from the Lord's Supper, is the Spirit of God to lead us into deeper truth and express things about Christ in a way that only He can. Yeah. And, and in terms of, like, how do I know that it's not me and it's the Spirit of God? And I, I, I again, I'm just going by, my thought is that the Spirit of God, you, if it's me, it'll always be within my comfort zone. But if it's the Spirit of God, it's outside my comfort zone. So, so, for instance, you have a message prepared, you have it all written out, you're... So, so I was at a conference and um, I, was, I had the Sunday morning message, I had it all planned, and when I had my quiet time that, that morning, the passage I read in my quiet time, I couldn't get it out of my head, and I knew I had to speak on that passage. I just knew, I knew I'd be in disobedience if I spoke on another passage. And I, 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 I said to the folks, this could be over in 10 minutes, I have no notes, I'm just gonna. But it was the message, everybody said it was the message of the conference because it was clearly the Spirit of God wanted that passage brought before the saints. And, and uh, you probably experienced the same. Sometimes it's uh, something comes out so astoundingly in the Lord's Supper that calls your attention to something that the, it seems that the Spirit really wants to be further addressed. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah, and sometimes actually at the Lord's Supper, well, quite often, I've had confirmation about the line of thought that I had for the message. Had somebody, somebody who knew nothing about what I was going to speak on gets up and says something, and it's like, yes, Lord, this is what you want me to do. The other way to find out is the flesh, how this came to mind. A lot of your thoughts and meditations while you're approaching the door of the building. I'll use the uh, sin and the trespass object as an example of you leaving for the Lord to be right for him to begin with. And that has to be dealt with outside before you come in. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that is uh, one way of looking at is it a flesh or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, he wants to, the Spirit of God wants to work through a clean vessel. That story that you mentioned in 1 Kings 15 is quite unique in that in the Old Testament, the three main archetypes of the flesh are the Ishmaelites, which you mentioned, um, 
sorry, Ishmael or Ishmaelites, the Malachites, and then Saul. Those are the three big pictures of the flesh. But that's an unusual story because you have two pictures of the flesh in the same chapter, which explains why Saul couldn't kill Agag. The flesh will never mortify the flesh. So the spirit man, spiritual man, Samuel comes in in his early 70s with a sword and hacks Agag into pieces. And that really reflects the spirit of God when he wants to do the flesh. Saul stopped at Carmel, built a pillar of the accomplishment. He was gloating in Agag. The flesh floats in the flesh, but will never mortify the flesh. That's why Saul couldn't kill Agag. The flesh will never mortify the flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Sorry, just going to say, years ago I heard a series of ministry on Saul and David, the man of the flesh, man of the spirit, and it was, that was tremendous. Go ahead. I, I got a question. It's a real question, my friend. You might not grasp this, but how does one switch to the spirit from the flesh? So you're, everything's programming, I mean, moving sweetly, nicely along this fine day. Then, the thought jumps into your head. Maybe you should just take a wee look at the news. Now, you might, yeah, this is just Chris Stutters. Never mind, it no. And I think to myself, so that comes very strongly. And I think, yeah, that'd be a good idea. So, I get over to the computer, look at it. Well, there's a lot of things going on there in Canada, Russia, Ukraine, and so on and so forth. And I think to myself, why ever did you waste one and a half hours on this garbage? Because all that's done is you've got that zooming through your mind. And I think to myself, how do you, when something bing like that just hammers you, buddy, Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry, right now. <laughs> you switch to the spirit. And I think what you said at the, towards the end, have a plan. Maybe that's the key. Yeah, and, and, and one, one of the plans that the, the Lord has is you bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. But how are you going to do that, man, when, every, when it's so strong? I don't think nothing else, buddy. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting though that you, you get that when you have that. You, you, you still have a choice. Do I go to the computer? Or do I go away from the computer? You still have a choice. And no matter how strong it is, you still have that choice. And, you, and again, you can cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to waste an hour and a half. And then you could even pray, Lord, show me something constructive that I could do. Because you want to you wanna replace this negative thing with something. You can't just do nothing. Right. If you do nothing, you're going to be thinking about what you wanted to do in the first place. You have, to, you have to find something else constructive to do in its place. Thank yeah. you. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. Along with what Chris is saying here, you know, I've had over the years many times that a very selfless thought or act that I should do, and then the immediate thought afterwards, oh yeah, because then everybody's going to like what you're doing. Yeah, they're going to give you a pat on the back. And it's just, it stopped me a lot of times from doing the initial selfless act, going like, oh, that, am I just doing this for me? Yeah, it's interesting that um, I, I do think that um, part of the fiery darts of the evil one are thoughts that can come into our minds. And we have to learn how to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so it could be things like that where you're, you want to do the right thing and then you kind of, the enemy comes in and say, yeah, what a great guy you are and all the rest of it, you know, so. So I think we've got we've to recognize that this, this is a battle. I, I guess the, the big thing, we're, like, we're in a war. <laughs> But we have, we got to remind ourselves, on the mount, with hands raised, is the Lord Jesus. He wants us to finish well. 
He's praying for us. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have resources. We have the armor of God. We need to be putting on the armor of God. We, 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 but we need to study the passages that deal with our warfare. It is a daily thing. And, and that's why this kind of topic is, is important because next week, like we're going to get opportunities to deal with some of these things. Maybe even before next week, as we get tired and during the week, Amalek may decide to come and join us. Acts 5 would be a good example of what is called demonic obsession with Ananias and Sapphira. Probably a, a bent or a stronghold of greed. Satan saw that and serves the thought and they go with it and then they lie to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes, Whitney. Yeah. Uh, this verse in uh, Matthew 12, verse 31. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Can you say something about that? I can say several things about that. One is that it affirms the absolute deity of the Holy Spirit, because you can't blaspheme somebody who's not divine. So we know that he is not just a person, but he's a divine person. And secondly, I do believe that Matthew 12 is the turning point of Matthew's gospel. And they, they witnessed an undeniable miracle in this chapter. Uh, and um, the religious leadership, instead of responding, e e this miracle was so evident, so clear, and, and even in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies that this is what the Messiah would do. And even the, the common people said, this is the son of David. What I'm saying is that. But the religious leadership said, he has a devil. Right? So, so I would suggest to you that this unpardonable sin could only be committed when Jesus is physically on earth doing undeniable miracles before a person's face and them seeing it and saying, he has a demon. So I think it's a dispensational sin. Right? So it could only be happen. And so he says, it will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. But what is the age to come? When will the Lord Jesus next be on the earth doing amazing things in the millennial kingdom? But in this age, where is he now? Father's right hand. So, so again, it's only a dispensational sin. Yes? It's my, it's my opinion that if we had an hour, we could talk about this subject. What do you do when that thought comes? When the, you're weak or you're tired and we have these besetting sins. Why is it that we have this shared knowledge and we, are, we feel free here to ask these questions, but we don't do it when we're in our own private assemblies? We have a young man in our assembly who's crying out for help. He struggles with the flesh so much. And yet we don't know what to do, like other than telling our experience. But is, is there something wrong with us having a specific series of meetings or studies? And people say, hey, whether you're struggling with, let's say, pornography, because that's a common thing for this generation or this age that we're in. Um, is there something wrong with that? Is it, are we not supposed to do that? Like, what's yeah. the hindrance that we don't have yeah. that? So, so uh, it's, it, it is interesting to me that, like, in the back in the 1800s, there was a there was a, a, there's a movement called the Keswick Convention. And the Keswick movement talked about victorious Christian living. And now Reformed theology hates Keswick theology. Just hates it. Because they want you to stay under the wall. They want you to live in Romans 7 forever. Right? So because of that, it's got a lot of criticism. So now we don't talk about holiness. And we live with the results of it, which is distinct unholiness. So I think we need teaching in our assemblies on practical sanctification. And the other side of that equation is we also need to support one another, exhort one another daily while it's today. So if there's a brother who's struggling, uh, we need somebody to come alongside, maybe you, and say, brother, whenever you have a temptation, call me, let's pray together, let's get together, have a coffee, let's do something, give him an out, right, so that he you know, strengthen them. Yeah, I had a friend, he was a, he had a, he had grown up in, the English culture is very 
um, centers around the pub and drinking, and this guy got saved, and, and yet uh, he was still struggling and occasionally get discouraged and go back to the pub. But, but he, he had a, a brother who, when he was missing, he knew where he'd be. He knew where he used to, and he'd go into the bar, tap on his shoulder, say, come on, brother, you don't belong here, and he'd pull him out. And that guy went on to be a great servant of the Lord, but he just needed somebody to walk with him in those early days of struggle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need that. We need somebody to walk alongside us. And we've got to be honest, right? I mean, part of um, what well, he who covers his sin will not prosper. So, so there has to be an honesty of saying, a vulnerability. Brethren, will you pray for me? I'm struggling in this area. Now, we don't like that. And maybe part of it is maybe some people like to go and gossip about that. Somebody shares that with you. you don't, it's not something to be publicly broadcast, you know. But at the same time, we just, we, we need to be vulnerable with one another. I need help. I want to please the Lord, but I'm struggling in this area. Would you walk with me through this? One of the things that just comes to mind there is intimacy. Intimacy is broke down into this. Into me you see. And that intimacy happens, you know, if you're sharing something with me, I get to see into you. And then I, I don't want to share into you what's happened in my life because that now becomes intimate. You become vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, just think about it, you know, like, let someone see into your life. We're to confess our sins one to another. And, uh, you know, I have a, a brother, uh, Prince George. I asked him to come to the conference. No, he's working on something different. And he told me how he was addict, is addicted to pornography and he's working on getting a group together. A, and it's a Christian program. It's almost like AA for mm -hmm. brothers who are addicted to pornography, right? And I'm going, well, hey, I, I got addicted when I was nine. You know, and it's just, it took me years where I could actually say that because I was so ashamed, right? You know, I'm not only looking at pornography and stuff like that, but the temptation, oh, it's there. i got to put my hand up lots because I want to look, right? Yeah, and, and as we said, the flesh doesn't improve, and it doesn't, you know, it, sa it says in Scripture, flee youthful lusts, but I'm not a youth anymore. The youthful lusts don't flee from us. Yes, sir. Well, I notice there's a tremendous divergency into the uh, people's <coughs> personal conviction. Some people can be convicted that they are sinners for doing a certain thing, and others can do the same thing and feel that uh, they're, they haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people don't seem to have a conscience about things, and other other Christians think that that thing is utterly heinous. So really, yeah. who knows what sin is unless the Spirit convicts you, and yet it seems that some Christians are not convicted of, of those things which other Christians are. Yeah. So, so again, it raises an interesting issue, and that is, like, how much ministry have you heard over the years on the conscience? Mm. Conscience, right? Because you can have a seared conscience, or you can, you know, Paul sought to always have a conscience void of offense before God and man. He obviously had a very tender conscience, and so we need to pray, Lord, don't ever let me become seared in my conscience. Keep my conscience very tender. And but again, people, again, if we don't, if these things are not talked about, like the conscience, people don't even realize what's going on. But, well, I think, I don't know who's, yeah. yes, yes. Matt in control here. <laughs> Father, we just pray that uh, the things that we've considered together in this last hour, Lord, we just don't want to walk away and 